okay. A very good morning to you all. You are warmly welcomed. Are you hearing it? Oh. Is it okay. A very good well, good morning to you all. You are warmly welcomed to today's lecture, Cornea Dystrophies. In considering this topic, we will look at the background information, classification, pathophysiology, clinical presentations, and treatment. Cornea dystrophies are a group of genetic, often progressive eye diseases in which abnormal material from often accumulate in the clear cornea. It may be asymptomatic in some individuals, but can also cause significant vision loss. Age of onset and symptoms vary among the different forms of cornea dystrophies. Most cornea dystrophies are bilateral, may progress slowly, and may run in families. Now, let's look at the classification of cornea dystrophies. We have the International Classification of Cornea Dystrophies, the IC3D. This has been developed to take account of the chromosomal loci of various cornea dystrophies, as well as the possible genes and mutation. It also incorporates the clinical and the pathologic information, as well as many aspects of traditional def definition. The IC3D classified cornea dystrophies into four categories. Most dystrophies previously considered stroma are now classified as either epithelial stroma dystrophies or stroma dystrophies. Let's look at category one. For a cornea dystrophy to be classified under the international classification under category one, it must have a well-defined cornea, it must be a well-defined cornea dystrophy in which a gene has been marked and identified identified and specific mutations are known. Category two, must for it to be under category two, it must be a well-defined cornea dystrophy that has been mapped to one or more specific chromosomal loci, but the gene or genes remain to be identified. In category three, a well-defined cornea dystrophy that has not been mapped to any chromosomal locus. And in category four, this category is reserved for suspected new cornea dystrophies or previously documented ones that information have now uh, uh, given back to it being removed from either category one or two or three to be placed in category four. Looking at the traditional classification of cornea dystrophy, this classifies cornea dystrophy based on their clinical findings and the specific layer of the cornea affected. That's the one most people use. And in considering that, it uh, um, classifies it into epithelial layer and Bowman's membrane, stroma, and then desment and endothelium. Classification of cornea dystrophies based on their location within the cornea. We have one, the anterior cornea dystrophies, 
These are fed to the corneal epithelium, the epithelial basement membrane, and may involve the Bowman membrane. Under this category, we have the epithelial basement membrane, this trophy, also known as the anterior basement membrane dystrophy or map dot fingerprint dystrophy. We also have the leash corneal dystrophy, mesmana corneal dystrophy, resbuckler corneal dystrophy, and talbanki corneal dystrophy. Under the stroma corneal dystrophies, these are said the stroma, and under it we have gelatinous drop like corneal dystrophy, granular corneal dystrophy and its variants, type 1, type 2, lattice corneal dystrophy and its variants, and macular corneal dystrophy and its variants. Now, the posterior corneal dystrophies. This involves the desmond membrane and endothelium. Under this, we have congenital hereditary endothelial corneal dystrophy, first endothelial corneal dystrophy, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy, Schindler Krishna corneal dystrophy. Now, going back to the international classification, the IC3D, you will now discover that some of the uh, traditional classified ones under the anterior stroma now comes under the epithelial stroma corneal dystrophies. Here we have the resbuckler corneal dystrophy, Telbanki corneal dystrophy, lattice corneal dystrophy type 1, and the variant uh, granular corneal dystrophy type 1 and type 2. Under the IC3D, the stroma corneal dystrophies now become macular corneal dystrophies and its variants, Chidna Krishna corneal dystrophy, congenital stroma corneal dystrophy, posterior amorphous corneal dystrophy, central cornea, central clouding dystrophy of Franco's, and pre testament corneal dystrophy. Now, we are going to consider some specific corneal dystrophies. We all know that corneal dystrophy is a rare disease. And, but if you don't look for it, we don't see it. There are some that are more seen than others. Now, map that fingerprint corneal dystrophy. This got its name from the characteristic appearance of very tiny dots, microcysts, appearing grayish area in, on the cornea that collectively look like maps or fine lines that resemble fingerprints. It's also known as Kogan's dystrophy or Kogan's microcyst epithelial dystrophy or epithelial basement dystrophy. It's quite common, but not familiar. It's not progressive, rather it's variable and fluctuates in its curves. Usually bilateral, but can be unilateral. It can be very asymmetrical in presentation. The possible coded gene is the growth the transforming growth factor beta-induced gene, also known as the BIGH3 gene. This TGF beta-induced gene is located on chromosome 5Q31. Some authors think it's a degenerative disease rather than a dystrophy. What is the pathophysiology? 40 basement membrane, which results to thickened multi lamina, which misdirects into the epithelium. It will now give rise to the deeper epithelial cells. Instead of migrating to the surface, they will just become entrapped. These epithelial cells anterior to the aberrant basement membrane may now have difficulty forming viable any dismissal and the basement membrane complexes, which attach 
to the underlying trauma, resulting in recurrent erosion. So there is unstable basement membrane. This irregular corneal surface will induce astigmatism, hence decrease in vision. What is the histology? The histology will show thickened basement membrane and fibrillar granular material in the cornea. Now, you can see the micro cyst there. You could also see the fine lines. Here you could see the grayish deposits, which will appear like dots here. And here we have the grayish deposits, which now look like a map. When you look at it, this looks like a map. What are the clinical presentations of map dots? Fingerprint dystrophy. Uh, we have blood vision. There is recurrent erosion, which will give pain and tearing. They have glare. They have distortion of images. They have photophobia. They also have refractive error, which is usually irregular astigmatism. Under the slit lamp biomicroscopy, you will see irregular geographic shots, faint gray white patches that may contain clear over areas, varying in shapes and sizes, ranging from one millimeter to several millimeters. The cornea dots are grayish white potty like opacities, which can be round, comma shaped, or irregular. It varies in shapes and in sizes, and the sizes varies from 0.05 millimeter to one millimeter. There are also cornea blebs, which are clear round bubble-like defects, measuring 0.05 to 0.2 millimeters in diameter, best seen with ritual illumination. What is the dive? Differential diagnosis of map dot fingerprints, cornea abrasion, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, happy simplex infection, happy zoster infection, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, and other causes of cornea erosions. You have the pseudo fingerprints or split lines. This we usually see in elevated IOP and cases of glaucoma or trauma with cornea decompensation. You will also see uh, um, pseudo effective and the effective bolus keratopathy are also the differential diagnosis. We also have posterior polymorphous dystrophy, keratoeviatis, cornea trauma with endothelial cell damage as differential diagnosis. How do we treat map dot fingerprint dystrophy? Medical therapy, use of hypertonic drops, 5% sodium chloride. And this you do, you use not in the acute phase, after the acute phase. You could also use extended wear bandage contact lens you could also patch the eye because the pain arises from rupture of the microcyst giving rise to erosion. When you patch, you give time for the cornea to heal. And use of non hypothenic lubricants like ointments. You could use the Vaseline ointments or, or or antibiotic ointments. Rigid contact lenses can be used to improve vision, but that will worsen the cornea fragility. And if you need to use that, then it has to be under an extended wear soft bandage contact lens. Surgical treatment, vibramor, 
and superficial keratitis, keratectomy, sorry. How do we do the superficial keratectomy? You can do that in the clinic using the tumoral spatula under the slate lab. You could also do it in the theater using the diamond ball knife. Or the patient could also have photo, phototherapeutic keratectomy with a Zyman laser, which is more expensive. The other surgical treatment could be cornea anterior stroma needle monitoring. But this do not usually work in map dust. It could be also a way of finding out whether the lesion you are seeing is due to trauma or is due to actually map dust. If it's due to trauma, needle puncture will work very well. But in map dust, it doesn't work because of the migratory nature of the disease. The second uh, uh, dystrophy we are going to consider is crystalline dystrophy, corneal dystrophy. It's an autosomal dominant inherited stroma dystrophy, usually bilateral, results from accumulation of cholesterol and lipid in the cornea stroma. The causative gene has been mapped to the UBI AD1 gene, which is present on IP36, the gene involved in cholesterol metabolism. It affects both cells equally. The disease may appear in the first decade of life, but diagnosis may be in the fourth decade of life. It progresses slowly. Most patients with advanced disease usually report being on cholesterol-lowering drugs. And there's usually a family history of elevated serum cholesterol, triglyceride, and lipoprotein. Clinical signs and symptoms. They, have, they, they will have decreased cornea sensation, especially in severe cases. It may co-present with xanthalysema, may be associated with the disease. There are the position of lipid crystals in the cornea stroma. They have objective loss of visual acuity, which is their visual acuity is worse in photopic condition, despite normal or good visual acuity under scotopic conditions. Now, this is the cholesterol lipid deposition. You can see it here. This forming like a disc-like opacity affecting the entire stroma. You can see this too. Now, this is crystalline corneal dystrophy in a 37-year-old patient. You could see it here, and you could see excessive acus in a 37 year old. Sorry. Compare it to this acus synalis in a 78 year old. You could now see that this patient has excessive acus at 37 years. Yes. Now, this shows as the crystalline dystrophy progresses, visual acuity reduces, and cornea sensitivity also reduces. It gets to a point where, when it's like this, usually by the time they are 39 years old and above, they will have a reduce facial acuity. What is the pathophysiology? The pathogenesis is unknown, but it's assumed to arise from lipid metabolism deficiency, especially high density lipoprotein, lipoprotein HDL. Cholesterol content is found to increase 
tenfold in affected persons. And the lipo, uh, the phospholipid content increases fivefold in these patients also. The immunohistochemical analysis revealed preferential deposition of apolipoprotein, components of a high density lipoprotein, APOA1, APA2, and APOC, north of low density lipoprotein. So when you look at the um, tissue specimen of these patients on the histology, you will see APA, APOA1, APOA2, and APOC, but not APOB, which shows that the low density lipoprotein is not affected. This suggests an abnormal metabolism in the cornea. What are the differential diagnoses? Systemic abnormalities affecting lipid metabolism, resulting in central cornea clouding. Under this, we have the fish eye disease, the lecithin cholesterol acetate transference deficiency. You have the tangier disease. Secondly, diseases with cornea crystals. You have cystinosis, these proteinemia, hyperuricemia, multiple myeloma, porphyria, primary or secondary lipid carathopathy, granular cornea dystrophy, hyperlipoproteinemia, lattice cornea dystrophy, and macular cornea dystrophy. So with all this, you know that once you have a patient with crystalline cornea dystrophy, you will investigate the patient for hyperlipidemia and hypercholesterol. What are the treatments? Phototherapeutic rifectomy. This can remove stop epithelial crystals if they cause decreased vision. But when the post trauma is involved, the PTK will not um, will not be amenable to treatment. We need a keratoplasty to be done. The other dystrophy we are going to talk to we are going to talk about today is macular cornea dystrophy. It's an IC3D category one dystrophy, autosomal recessive disease caused by mutation in carbohydrate sulfur transferase cis gene on chromosome CSQ22, resulting in a defect in the synthesis of carotene sulfates. Is the least common of the three stromal cornea dystrophies. That is the least three compared to granular and lattice cornea dystrophies, but most severe is characterized by multiple irregular grayish white opacities in the cornea stroma. Extends into the periphery cornea. So it starts from the middle of the cornea and then extends to the periphery. Recurrence in graph is less common as compared to others. That's the good thing about it. Unlike granular dystrophy, there is no clear area between opacities. Opacities first appear in adolescence, but may become obvious anytime from early infancy to the sixth decade of life. Cornea changes become obvious from age 20 to 40 years. There is no cell predilection. Severe visual impairment may occur from the fifth decade. Once opacities collapse and the central stroma become cloudy, vision will be affected. 
three variants have been identified. Now, these are the Sorry. You can see, you can see that in between the opacities, there is no clear cornea. When we get to granular cornea dystrophy, you will see the difference. What is the pathophysiology? Though a stroma disease, but desment and endothelium can be involved. Serum keratinine sulfate may or may not be positive depending on the variant. There is a systemic disorder in keratin sulfate synthesis. The variants of macular dystrophy that exist depend on the immunoreactivity of the macular deposits. Type 1. In this particular type in type one, which is the classic one, there is no immunoreactive keratin sulfate, either in the cornea stroma or in the keratocytes or in the serum or in the cartilage. Type 1A, in this, there is keratin sulfate immunoreactivity in keratocytes, but not in serum nor cornea stroma or a cartilage. Type two, there is keratin sulfate immunoreactivity in stroma, keratocytes, or cartilage and serum, but in very low amount. What are the clinical signs and symptoms? Visual acuity decreases as the disease progresses photosensitivity resulting in photophobia, eye pain from recurrent cornea erosion, centrally located whitish cornea opacities which extends to the peripheral cornea, stroma opacities distributed throughout the cornea without clear areas. We saw that in the photo picture, that the photo image. It involves the entire stroma, but more superficial centrally and deeper peripherally. Central cornea may be faint. Significant cornea gotata may be seen in severe cases. What are the differential diagnoses? Crystalline cornea dystrophy, granular cornea dystrophy, and lattice cornea dystrophy. How do we diagnose macular cornea dystrophy? Diagnosis is usually clinical, but can be confirmed by a cornea uh, tissue. Of course, we know that clinically, biopsy is not indicated. But when you do a cornea transplant, the recipient button can be sent for histochemical analysis. And this will demonstrate glycosamine glycan, which stands with alkene glue and collider ion. And under the light microscope, the glycosamine glycan tissues will also be seen in the tissue. What is the treatment? Treatment of recurrent erosion, like we said in map dot, using ointment, hypertonic saline, uh, bandage contact lens, extended wear, uh, uh, antibiotic lubricants and things like that. So, um, patching. Now, artificial tear also could be used and phototherapeutic parathectomy with a zymar laser. You could also ask patients to use sunglasses to prevent glare. Laminar or full thickness cornea transplant though success rate is high, deposits still occur. But the good thing is that the deposit is amenable to PTK. Granular cornea dystrophy. And 
IC 3D category dystrophy, inheritance mode is autosomal dominant, usually bilateral, non-inflammatory condition with deposit of discrete irregular shaped opacities in the cornea seen at adulthood. It affects middle portion of the stroma, can cause decreased vision. There is no sense with the lesion noted. Age of onset is before second decade. Two types clinically have been identified, the classic type and the avalina type, which have fewer cornea deposits. At times, this will resemble a combination of lattice and granular dystrophy. Age of onset is before second decade. Results from mutation in the TGF beta I gene. Here, you can see the type 1. These are the type 1, showing you breadcrumb like appearance. When you look at it, you'll find that in between the deposits, there is clear cornea, unlike macular dystrophy. This is the type 2, the avalina type. And when you look at this, you will see the breadcrumb deposit, and you will see things that, sorry, you will see these lines that looks like, you will see these lines that look like a, like a lattice. What is the pathophysiology? Through a stroma dystrophy, the epithelium and Bowman layer may be affected in late disease. An autosomal dominant condition and uh, it's been mapped to chromosome 5 Q. They have a synophilic hyaline deposit in the corneal stroma. The source of this hyaline deposit material is still unknown. Deposit stains bright red with mansion trichome stain indicating the presence of hyaline. Also, the pathologic deposits were asked with antibodies to carotene epithelium. Staining with Congo red would give you a bright apple green color on cross polarization, indicating the presence of amylite. Clinical signs and symptoms. Vision is affected in the fourth and fifth decade when the opacity becomes confluent. Pain from recurrent cornea erosions. Sensitivity resulting in glare and photophobia. Bilateral information by bilateral formation of discrete focal white granular deposit in the anterior cornea stroma without affecting the peripheral cornea, which we saw earlier. Stroma deposits resemble crushed breadcrumb or snowflakes, which we saw earlier on the photo picture. The stroma deposit increases in sizes and number with age. Eventually, the intervening clear area of the cornea with, with non-developed mild to severe cornea hairs and resulting in poor vision. What are the differential diagnoses? Crystalline cornea dystrophy, lattice cornea dystrophy, macular cornea dystrophy, map.cornea dystrophy. These dystrophy are usually seen in the in people from Europe. It was first um, described by a German ophthalmologist in 1890. Meanwhile, the Avelina type was first seen in a family of four in Italy. But now you could see uh, both in all over the world. So we need to look out for these dystrophies. Treatment. 
treatment of a recurrent cornea erosion, patching, antibiotic ointment, extended wear bandage contact lens, uh, 5% sodium chloride artificial tear, photo therapeutic antectomy. Cornea transplant, this has high success rate, but with time, deposit will occur. But the good thing is the reoccurrence, the reoccurrence deposits are superficial health, hence PTK will be able to take care of the deposits. Lattice cornea dystrophy. This is a rare disease, inherited condition, autosomal dominant fashion, characterized by amyloid deposits in the cornea stroma, usually bilateral, slowly progressive. Two genetical distinct types have been identified. Type one, which is the classic type, primary amyloidosis localized to the cornea only. Onset of disease is in the first decade of life, but visual deterioration starts at about 40 years. They usually retain good vision till 70 years. The genetic defect of type 1 lattice dystrophy is mapped to TGFB1 FBI gene on chromosome 5Q. The type 2, which is also known as the Gelsoline or the Meritoja syndrome type, has a systemic amyloidosis in addition to the cornea deposits. Onset of disease is in the fourth and fifth decade. It results from a mutation in the GSN gene. The type two may also be associated with pseudo exfoliation and glaucoma apart from the cornea deposit. The systemic manifestation include cranial nerves and peripheral neuropathies, which can result in facial paresis, loss of peripheral vibration sense and touch, autostatic hypotension, and cardiac abnormalities. So when you see these patients, you have to do a detailed systemic examination. Diminished cornea sensation. These are the lattice lines. You could see the lines here, and you could see the refractive bodies here. This is the type 2, the Marotoja type 2. You could see the deposits here. And and with retro illumination, you could see it highlighted the lines which are highlighted. You could see these lines that are highlighted in the cornea stroma. Clinical signs and symptoms. Pain due to recurrent erosion. They also have photophobia due to photosensitivity. Early in life, there are subtle opacities which we saw earlier on the picture. And once you see that, then you need to monitor the patient in the anterior stroma. The radial uh, lines branches off to form the lattice pattern, which from there it got its name. And then this will form the intervening hairs. Later in the course of the disease, lattice lines extend to the cornea periphery and progress to deep stroma. Treatment. Treatment. Treatment of cornea recurrent erosion, like we have highlighted before, laser surface ablation using a zyma laser for PTK. Visual rehabilitation, 
partial or full thickness graft, which have very high success rates. And most patients will retain good vision throughout life. Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. This is characterized by a symmetrical bilateral slowly progressive edema of the cornea in the elderly. When inherited, the transmission is by autosomal dominant. Females are affected more than males to the ratio of three to one. Cornea endothelia, a monolayer acts as a major form to detrogrease the cornea and maintain clarity. It does this in two ways, by acting as a barrier to the movement of salt and metabolites into the stroma and by actively pumping bicarbonate ions out of the stroma back to the aqueous humor. When this pump fails, gotata forms between the endothelium and desmoid membrane. This is the root cause of focus. The normal attrition rate of um, endothelial cells is usually 0.6% per year. But in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, this is accelerated, hence potata forms. As the lesion enlarges, the covering endothelial cell that was initially stretched falls out. And as the disease also advances, vascular connective tissues are formed under the epithelium, resulting in epithelial erosion and corneal vascularization. Fuchs manifests when both the stroma and the endothelium uh, layer is edematous. The presence of central corneal gotata in early age is a warning sign. So when patients come to the clinic, we don't just do, we do a detailed slit lamp examination because you might see a warning sign. When you see central corneal gotata, that shows you that all is not well. That could be gotata peripheral, but not in the central part of the cornea. The disease usually are manifest in the sixth and seventh decades. First, dystrophy passes through four clinical stages, which evolve over a period of two to three decades. Stage one. This stage is characterized by central corneal gotata and the endothelium. These are usually accidental findings and is better seen by specular reflection. You will also see pigment dots. So when you see central gotata pigment dots, it's a red alert that this patient eventually in later years may develop cornea, folks cornea dystrophy. It's asymptomatic, usually an accidental finding when patients are being examined for other pathologies. As the disease progresses, still in, in um, stage one, these gotatas now increase in number and may become confluent, resulting in beaten metal appearance of the endothelial surface. The condition spreads from the center to the periphery. Vision is usually very good and the patient don't come complaining of poor vision. The patient might come complaining of probably um, conjunctivitis or something else that when you now examine the patient under the slit lamp, doing a detailed slate lamp examination, you will not discover that this patient has central gotata and that could be some uh, tobacco dust centrally too. Treatment is conservative. You just tell the patient that we need to be seeing you and that uh, uh, you may develop um, a more serious condition in future. Stage two. In this stage, vision is impaired due to stroma edema. 
initially and subsequently epithelial edema. Patient sees halos and we have pretty sensation. Bullet results when the epithelial microcysts collapse, hence the name bullous keratopathy. The epithelial nerve endings are destroyed, resulting in reduce or loss of cornea sensation. Pain and foreign body sensation will occur. Strayer on the desmond will cause wrinkling of the desmond membrane. So when you see a patient under the slit lamp and you see wrinkling, if you see the desmond wrinkle and the, and the IOP is not low to so give foot, but to see some wrinkling, then you may also need to now uh, check and see whether there are gotatas or there are tobacco dolls and things like that in the, uh, in the corner. Treatment is medical therapy using hypertonic saline and lubricant and bandage contact lens. Stage three, in this stage, there is connective tissue formation and panels in basement membrane. Also, peripheral cornea vascularization, epithelial edema and bullet may reduce, but stroma edema persists. And when this happens, the patient will come back to tell you that he's more comfortable and the vision may be better than what it is in stage two. Then there is epithelial layer. The epithelial layer is threatened by underlying panels and fibrous tissue. Treatment is cornea transplant, desmond membrane endothelial keratoplasty. Stage four. In this stage, there is vasc fibrovascular proliferation followed by subepithelial scarring. Vision is poor. Treatment is cornea transplant. You could do DMEC or you could do uh, a full thickness graft. Uh, most of the patients that we see and uh, who, who may have folks. So it is very important for us to look at the other eye because the two eyes may not be apart. One may be worse than other. So when you look into the other eye, you may be able to see central rotata and then you may be able to see cornea edema. These are photo pictures of folks. You could say, you could say the erosions here, you could say the cornea edema, you could say cornea edema affecting the whole cornea. These are slit lamp photo of potato. You can see these are abnormal endothelial cells. These abnormal endothelial cells will now spread out and they will destroy the normal cells too. This is a pseudo gutata, which we usually see when a patient comes with keratouvertes, with uh, uh, with treatment, with treatment, this patient will recover fully. This is an OCT picture of a patient with Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. This is an OCT picture. You can see how thick the stroma is. You can see the endothelial layer, how it is, and you could say, you could see that there are bullae in the epithelium too. Now, this is the same patient. This is an OCT picture of the same patient after the patient has had a DMEC. You can see how nicely, you can see how nicely 
you can say her nicely, the, the cornea is. And compare it, compare this to this. What is the pathophysiology in folks? There is slowly progressive formation of cotata lesions between the endothelium and desmond. This uh, worked, this mushroom like uh, growth, they are abnormal elaborations of the basement membrane. And the fibrillar collagen results in distress or um, dystrophic endothelial cells. This will now enlarge, covering the endothelial cells initially stretched, which will now later fall out. The newly deposited abnormal portion of this desmond membrane progressively destroys the endothelia, the remaining endothelial cells. Because of the limited number of functioning endothelial cells, the barrier and pump function fails to maintain the delicate balance. Hence, excessive hydration of the cornea, resulting in cornea decompensation. The edema fluid suppresses the cornea lamina and forms fluid leg, which we saw at the OCT. The suppression of collagen fibrins lead to clouding of the cornea. As the disease progresses, the fluid enters the epithelium, resulting in irregular epithelial surface. The retina image will become blurred. The edema varies from slight moistening to frank bully formation. What are the clinical signs and symptoms? The patient will come complaining of hollows around light, gritty of foreign body sensation, poor vision, pain, redness, tearing, irritation, photophobia. Differential diagnosis, post-operative cornea edema, cornea erosions, uh, pseudo-effective or effective bolus keratopathy. Now we are now going to look at the posterior polymorphous cornea dystrophy, PPMD. PPMD. It's a dominantly inherited condition, autosomal dominant. An endothelial dystrophy. Initially, it was thought to be the type 1 of CHEG. It was thought to be the type 1 of CHEG, and that was why, in, in, you know, pre, previously, people will tell you that CHEG, there is CHEG 1 and CHEG 2. But it's been discovered that um, it doesn't really have all the properties. All the properties it has falls into posterior polymorphous cornea dystrophy. It's slowly, it's slowly progressive and at times non-progressive. Some people might be asymptomatic. Cornea endothelium undergoes a transformation resulting in multi-layer endothelium. Most patients will exhibit vesicular lesion, which is a hallmark of PPMD. Patients usually will present between 30 to 50 years. Though a bilateral disease is marked, there is marked asymmetric between the two eyes. It has been associated with Alport syndrome and keratoconus. This disease is linked to a mutation in an unidentified gene located at brand 20Q11. Some authors have located a gene coding for collagen A located on chromosome 1 as the cause of PPMD. So there's still a lot of research still going on. Uh, Concerning this particular dystrophy. In other, in other cases, the gene locus remain unknown. There is no sex predilection and no non racial predilection. 
but initially it was dictated around the uh, uh, the island. There is vascular changes in pathophysiology, the endothelial band lesion, and then there is irregular diffuse opacity of desmet membrane and endothelium. The cornea endothelium undergoes transformation and demonstrates epithelial characteristics. Hence, it now become, the endothelium become multi-layered. This has been demonstrated using histo, uh, immunohistochemical analysis and uh, light microscope and electron microscope. What are the clinical signs and symptoms? You will see areas of cornea opacity, the focal uh, esclerosis of the desmet membrane. There is aridocornea adhesion, pupillary atropium, goretopia, stroma, and epithelial edema. Cornea gotata, red IOP, peripheral anterior synecia, foreign body sensation, photophobia, poor vision. What are the differential diagnoses? We have Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, primary congenital glaucoma. What is the treatment? Treatment of cornea edema, like we highlighted in others, and treatment of high IOP. If we go back to the clinical signs, we have peripheral anterior synechia and we have aridocornea adhesion. These are things that makes treatment challenge, if, you know, um, because cornea transplant with peripheral anterior synechia with um, aridocornea adhesion will pose a lot of challenges. And then most of the patients will have high OP. So you need to look out for high OP even after the uh, DEMEC or DSEC, uh, desmet uh, stripping endothelial keratopathy uh, or desmet membrane endothelial keratoplasty has been done. Congenital clothing of the cornea. There are various genetic metabolic, developmental, and idiopathic causes that can result in congenital clothing of the cornea. Common causes of congenital cornea clothing still remain glaucoma. Other common causes are bathroma, pithas anomaly, thymoid tumor or limbal dermoid, sclerocornea, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, infectious or inflammatory processes. Usually the viral infections. This is an acronym for people to remember congenital clouding of the cornea. Stumped, S stands for scleral S stands for sclerocornea. T, tears in desperate membrane, usually secondary to bad trauma or congenital glaucoma. U, also M, metabolic causes. P, Peter's anomaly. E, edema. D, dermoid. So once you have stampede, you will be able to decode it and then you'll be able to give all the differential diagnosis of congenital clothing of the cornea. Rare causes of congenital cornea clothing. You have cornea plana, cornea keloid, oculo auriculo, vertebra dysplasia, Gordinan Gollin syndrome, congenital cornea ataxia, congenital hereditary cornea stroma dystrophy, posterior polymorphous dystrophy, and fan syndrome. 
Now we are going to consider congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, CHED. Like I was saying when we were considering uh, the PPMD, I said that the, the CHED1 that was initially thought to be an autosomal dominant CHED1 is now known to be PPMD. And the CHED2, that is the autosomal recessive, is now CHED1. So now we have CHED1, which is just autosomal recessive disease. In CHED, corneal clouding manifests in infancy or during childhood. Patient present with light sensitivity. There could be photophobia, tearing, and um, uh, at times they may have nystagmus. Is present at birth, usually bilateral. Despite severe cornea cladding, the babies are comfortable. It presents to the ophthalmologist at two years. That is when parents will now begin to notice tearing, bright light photophobia, and then cornea healthiness. No ocular or systemic association with it. Third, maybe secondary to failure of regression of premodal endothelium during anterior chamber development. There could be a strong association uh, with uh, primary uh, congenital glaucoma. So once you have a patient that has cornea clouding, a child that has cornea clouding, and you know, um, and uh, the IOP is still very high, then consider congenital um, uh, primary, uh, primary congenital glaucoma. Clinical features, you have diffuse cornea. Clinical features, they have diffuse cornea clouding of limbus to limbus, relatively uniform. Epithelium may be irregular or roughened. Even though the clouding is diffuse and is intense, you will still be able to see uh, the iris and anterior chamber features. So if you have cornea clouding and the iris is not uh, visible, then you're not dealing with church. There is thickened desmet membrane. Ocular and there are normal or uh, normal other ocular and systemic structures. IOP may be raised due to thick thick bacimeter. So you may even have a false positive of raised IOP. Poor vision often leading to amblyopia. Beating copper appearance of the desmet membrane will be seen on slit lamp examination. And the other type of endothelial dystrophy which we are going to look at is the Habonian syndrome. This disease arises from recession. It arises from recession uh, of the SLC4A01 gene and um, which is located at chromosome two local on band 220 PL uh, 2013. Uh, some people um, has, it's been said that it's joined to check. So when you have Habonian syndrome, look out for check. Or if you have a patient that you think that, they, that is uh, check, and uh, the patient later on developed uh, a post-lingual sensory neural hearing loss, then 
you uh, just know that you are not dealing with change, you are dealing with Hamburgian syndrome. It manifests with diffuse bilateral cornea edema, and uh, apart from the blood vision, they have visual loss, they have nystagmus. So in patients that have, in children that have nystagmus with features or with, or with cornea clouding that looks like trend, you need to examine them thoroughly. Look out for post-lingual hearing loss which usually occur between 10 to 25 years. Now, um, we will take your questions. I have a question here that says that uh, since cornea dystrophies are genetic conditions, one, the question is one, how effective are these treatments? Two, do they reoccur after treatment? Three, what is the place of refraction in these patients with astigmatism? Okay, now the first uh, question, how effective is the treatment? If you have followed the lecture, uh, you will see that treatment is very effective. Cornea dystrophy, um, um, cornea transplant and cornea dystrophy has 99, 95 to 99% uh, success rate. And like I said, in granular and in uh, 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 macular dystrophy, even when the occurrence occurs, it's usually superficial, and phototherapeutic lattectomy will be able to uh, ablaze it. That is the question, uh, the answer for your yeah, uh, yeah, number one question. Then the number two question is, do they reoccur after treatment? Yes, they do reoccur, but not in all. And when they reoccur, they are superficial, hence amenable to uh, uh, PTK. Number three question is, what is the place of refraction in this patient with astigmatism? Of course, with astigmatism, refraction is important, but you should bear in mind, especially when this uh, cornea surface is irregular. Of course, the type of astigmatism you will have is the irregular type of astigmatism. So refraction is important, and also you could also use rigid contact lens on top of extended wear bandage or uh, uh, soft contact lens, which will give you a better uh, refractive uh, correction. Okay. In the absence of uh, no more questions, um, no, I want to go back to the just to the, I want to share.
Thank you. And have a, a wonderful weekend.